Garbajopet, Mogisal Mabit, Motemuli, Motemuli, video channel, video lexia, and what is a porum is extractive to look at the quotated politica, ecology, and socialism, and what clean about Axelepes, so this channel is a regalocated. I am porum is park lepshi, such a train movie with the science, there is a monks and a belly, a rural monks and a belly, Carlos Monger, Romanic Saubreps, extractivism, the post extractivist to the concept of his shesahep, they supplement the chairs, the ecologist to the economic, economic, or the political economy or perspective, then Hanguy Mata Turatipis, Kamuts or B, Ratipis, Politica, the Ratipis, Mimarta Baby are subs, the Discussi are subs, dress, all of the Mega, all of the TD Mashtabis, Mukone, Quilanem Shirogoritaris Chida, Peru, the Bolivia, the Shemtekayam, Latin American Quilanem Shi, except the Western Dakar Shirabit, the Rar system, every second time is power debate, every Roman is the same Quilanem Shimitis, Picro Prosakatolos to this Mosinem Sakatos context with Kansako with Saint Alessu, which never interrupt, Chen Ratmond, the Arab executive to the Quirana, Tunsa regional donors, Trent Armudgen. In the box, except there is <laughs> only one industry only. Color capital region, maybe. All the stories mean that first month in the British is a hype. Well, was a very obligatory. I was going to go and bully. Is it like it happened to the rural development? The rural development, social or emotional, but this time the centralization. Adam and Tom and Leo, but conflict and this can really be attractive to industry. This shows a hub that is a shame. Look, all those monsters are more than just a seven. Get to the blue group of what a cloud in us. Monetilis, the um process of the chart to Adamias, the Mrs. Clavit Sakit Habish, I have a Latin American developmental story, um, Mimartabis critic, as the Missy critic, Uga, and Elizabeth Mayak, but on Carlos Cadot's sit was, uh, dear Carlos, like, the floor is yours right now. I'm going to share the presentation and then uh, we can proceed. With the lecture, give me a second. Sure. Here we go. Mm. Thank you a lot again for for your commitment to be a part of this forum. Um, well, uh, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending uh, where you are. Uh, I want to thank. The first, uh, Tamar and Georgie, for this invitation and for the opportunity to participate in these uh, important extractive encounter, encounters looking at the situation uh, in the South Caucasus. Uh, I will try to uh, make a presentation on the global situation, uh, very much uh, based on the learnings uh, of the Latin American uh, experience. So, uh, what I'm talking about is that or the main message, the message of this presentation is that extractivism has uh, failed uh, to set the basis for a global, uh, inclusive and sustainable growth uh, and well-being, and that we really need to uh, search for ways to put in place something that here in Latin America we call a post-extractivist uh, transition. That's the main message. No? Now, uh, some background, no? Uh, we are coming out of what we call a commodity super cycle. Starting in the early 2000s, uh, the prices of uh, fossil fuels, uh, and here you can see the data uh, for crude oil Brent, and the prices of minerals, and here you can see the data for copper, uh, started uh, to grow. And they grew in a sort of a steady and steep way uh, between the early 2000s and uh, 2007 uh, in both cases. Then there was a, a little crash. You might remember the 2008 2009 financial crisis, but it was a short term crisis. And then uh, prices recuperated again all the way to 2011 12 in, in the case of minerals and a little bit further down the line uh, in the case uh, of uh, oil uh, 2014 and, and then uh, prices came down. In the case of minerals they started to come down in a slow but steady pace 
In the case of oil, you might recall, there was a crash in the prices uh, sometime between 2014 and, and 15, and then there was a little recovery, not so much, and now we are facing the situation uh, that we are facing uh, as with the uh, uh, quarantine lockdown measures uh, taken to prevent the expansion of COVID, we have embarked or entered into a global recession and uh, prices of minerals came down uh, and prices of oil actually crashed. You know? So that's, uh, that's where we are coming uh, from, this super cycle of commodities in which prices came up in an unprecedented way and then came down sharply in oil and little by little in the case of, of copper uh, in the middle of the, last, starting the middle of the last decade. The next please. Uh, this uh, commodity super cycle uh, was, uh, is explained by the economic growth of China. You can see the red line on top, no? Uh, as China grew, it became the main demander uh, for uh, energy and for minerals to sustain its growth and uh, the world followed, especially uh, those territories of the world that are uh, resource rich, I mean that have important reserves of uh, fossil fuels and of minerals and that responded to China's demand. Uh, you can see China on top and you can see the last, the lower one, uh, you can see their uh, resource-rich territories, no? Uh, in Central Europe, you can see Latin America, no? Uh, you can see other parts of the world, how they follow uh, China's pattern. So the world's growth or the behavior of, of, of the GDP of the world and the behavior of uh, the GDP of uh, resource-rich territories and countries followed pretty much the demand uh, posed by uh, China's economic uh, dynamic. No? As, uh, as you can see, uh, there was a peak in, in Chinese growth in year 2007. Uh, it was amazing, uh, close to 15 GDP points no? uh, of, of growth, and then started to come down, no? and has been steadily coming down since, and the rest of the world uh, has followed. So the main message here, there is a strong interaction between economic growth globally and in different territories, Chinese growth and the way Chinese growth uh, set the pace for a, a high demand in prices for minerals and oils. The next please. Now, the end result uh, of, of this process of these 20 years of commodity-led growth uh, has been a structural transformation, but not the one that everybody was expecting. No? Uh, since the 1950s, uh, there is an open debate about where our economies should go. And the prevailing idea, the consensus was that what was expected to happen was that we would transform uh, from rural uh, societies into more urban and industrialized uh, societies with the capacity to generate decent jobs, jobs with rights, uh, decent incomes, uh, and uh, strong industrial sectors. No? That promise, that uh, expectation uh, has failed. Uh, has not, that has not happened. In fact, there has been a transformation. The, pro the, the, the world at large has uh, undergone uh, a massive uh, process of industrialization. Uh, the amount of people living in rural areas, the amount of people living uh, out of agriculture, uh, cattle herding, or related rural activities has diminished in a very significant way. Uh, nevertheless, this transform and, and, and there has been urbanization. There has been a strong process of migration, a strong process of urbanization. But this urbanization uh, has been uh, has relied on uh, service sectors that have very low productivity, that in many cases are basically survival strategies of the poor in the cities, and do not that do not have the capacity. Uh, to generate decent jobs and incomes on a massive scale. Uh, this is a, a, a strong line of analysis uh, that has been uh, presented or produced by various uh, 
NGOs and, and in, in international organizations. The one that I think is more clear in explaining the relation between commodity-led growth and this kind of transformation that is not the one that we expected, needed, or wanted is UNCTAD, the United Nations Commerce, Trade, and, and, and Development Entity. They have specialized reports on the relations between commodities and uh, the worldwide economic transformation. I would refer uh, to them. They have all the comparative data, etc. No? Now, uh, talking specifically about natural resources along, along these years, starting with the 50s, then uh, even more uh, with the start of globalization as we know it uh, today, no? in, in the early 90s, and especially so during this commodity super cycle, is that uh, natural resources in resource-rich territories, we're talking about minerals, hydrocarbons, land, oceans, water, whatever, no? uh, have been taken over by large-scale investors displacing uh, local populations. No? This is what uh, geographer David Harvey uh, has called accumulation by dispossession. Then there you have the text from when, where this concept is developed, accumulation by dispossession. Uh, this has been also named land grabbing, and a good reference is this international NGO called GRAIN that follows uh, land issues across the world. No, but in, in, in both cases, uh, the concept is, is the same. No resources that were in the hands of the local populations that sustain the ways of life of local populations uh, have been appropriated no? uh, by uh, international uh, investors uh, as, as an important critical feature of uh, the process of globalization. And this has been accelerated during this uh, commodity uh, super cycle. And it has, this has uh, come along with uh, severe, serious problems of bad governance, uh, including corruption, including conflict, including authoritarianism, uh, I would add a massive violation of human rights, no? uh, all kinds of problems that has to, has to do not with the economy, but with the decision making, the institutional setup the power relations, the way uh, decisions uh, are made around uh, these issues. The next one, please. Uh, these are two illustrations of uh, what comes out of UNCTAD uh, regarding the economy and poverty and diversification, and then what comes out of the worldwide governance indicators that are produced uh, by the World Bank. Uh, on the left one, uh, you can see, uh, if you look at the product groups, no, you can see that uh, most uh, countries with the blue and, and, and red uh, symbols, which are the energy countries, energy-rich countries, and mineral-rich countries, are located on the left of the equation, uh, which means that they are heavily concentrated. No? They, they, they have become or they have reinforced or they have developed a primary exporting economy, meaning that their growth and their public incomes depend mostly on the export or one of two minerals or oil or a combination of both. No? And you can see on the right that agricultural-based uh, countries are more diverse. No? But then you can see on the bottom and, and on the left and, and the bottom, no, uh, this is where most mining and all countries are located. So they are not only uh, not diversified, they are not only heavily concentrated, but they are also poor. Their GDP per capita is the lowest. No? And that's the end result of, of, of this process that opened up in the 50s, got accelerated uh, in the 90s with globalization as we know it now, and further accelerated uh, in this commodity super cycle. No? So we have countries that are heavily specialized and therefore dependent on the export of one or two commodities, especially mining and oil, and that at the same time are the poorest. No? While on the upper right, you can see some countries that uh, are not so dependent and are richer, no? and those are the ones doing best. And except for Australia and a couple of other countries, 
you barely see oil and mining as a feature of the countries that are doing best. And on the low left, you see that mining and oil prominent, uh, features prominently in the countries that are the worst off as a result of these long-term processes. That's why I call this is the failure of uh, commodity-led growth uh, as uh, a basis for inclusive and sustainable development. We are too dependent and we are too poor. That's the end result. Now, on, on the right side, I, I have uh, worked on uh, governance uh, indicators only for the Latin America region, okay? Uh, because it was difficult to present in one single graphic information for various parts of the world. And I have only uh, uh, chose uh, two of the six indicators or the five indicators that compose the, the governance index of the World Bank. I'm looking at voice and accountability, and I'm looking at control of corruption. But the end result is, is, is the same if, if you look at all or any of, of the other indicators. The message here is the following. Uh, the two countries that do better, that have better governance indicator altogether are Uruguay and Costa Rica in a consistent way, okay? And, uh, uh, and sometimes Chile. Uh, now, it has to be noticed that Uruguay and Costa Rica do no mining and do no oil altogether. Uh, Chile does a lot of mining, okay? But the point here is that the countries that do better in Latin America in terms of governance, including voice accountability, political stability, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, rule of law, and control of corruption, are the two that do not depend on oil or minerals. While, with the exception of Chile, that is a very mining country, but at the same time has very strong institutions, mostly the more oil-dependent countries and the more mining-dependent countries are below the Latin American average. To say it in other words, the more mining-dependent you are, the more oil-dependent you are, possibly you have the worst governance. The less you depend from these natural resources for your production, your investments, your exports, your fiscal incomes, the better you are in terms of governance indicators. And this is not a leftist NGO, and this is not a Marxist academic. This is the World Bank, okay? The next, please. So, I mean, we have been uh, speaking about the situation where we are at uh, after 40 years of globalization, 20 years of commodity super cycle. No? What's coming? What are the perspectives? Uh, in the case of fossil fuels, we're seeing the twilight, the end. No? Uh, according to British Petroleum, again, not an environmental NGO or an anti-capitalist or anti-fossil fuel academic, but according to a British Petroleum, uh, oil and coal have probably peaked. Their prime has passed, and from now on, they are going down, no? Uh, the graphic shows you the expected uh, share of the market for liquid fuels, no? Uh, in, in the business as usual scenario, oil has already peaked. Now, if we really move uh, a, to control uh, global warming, if measures are taken to impose a carbon tax and whatnot, you can see that the way uh, liquid fuels are going to lose shares of the market is impressive. But the point is that even if we do nothing just because of the evolution of the market, oil is past its peak. No? And this is very important. No? Uh, so if this is the situation, uh, the problem is that uh, governments and companies uh, are still negotiating deals to invest and to subsidize this industry that has no future. No? Uh, in fact, uh, we are noticing this in Latin America, governments and companies are negotiating what we call 
race to the bottom policies to facilitate investments. Why, by this, by race to the bottom, we mean the lowering of environmental and social standards, uh, procedures, in the weakening of the institutions in charge, or the relaxing of the enforcement of these standards and policies uh, in order to help the oil industry. No? And that's a huge risk because that means that a lot of public money is going to go into investments that actually have no future. Uh, what we need is the opposite. What we need is to launch what we call just energy transitions. We means everybody working on these matters. No? Uh, so we have to have energy transitions that are globally fair, meaning that the countries that are responsible for, the, for global warming, in this case, historically responsible, the US and Europe, and currently responsible because they are the highest emitters, China, no? they have to pay uh, for the control of global warming. Uh, they have to pay to come up with the funds to help lesser developed countries that do not have any responsibility in global warming no? uh, to undergo these kind of transitions and even to leave their oil and coal and gas resources under the ground. They have to be nationally fair, not only globally fair, uh, because uh, the poor in each country have less responsibility than the rich and the business elites and the political elites uh, in, in the generation of this uh, situation. So the poor need to be helped out. You need to fund adaptation policies, not to see that people are, are able to deal with the impacts of global warming and energy transitions. No? They have to be economically and socially fair uh, alternative jobs need to be created. Uh, this is the experience in Germany and Spain. If you move out of coal, you have to provide alternative uh, jobs and, and, and source of livelihoods uh, for those who were involved in the coal uh, economy in, in these countries. No, and it has to be sustainable. It cannot be. I mean, it cannot be artificially sustained. No. Uh, it, it has to be able to make a life out of its own. Uh, so that's the, but the, the basic message here is there is no future to carry on investing in fossil fuels, to carry on producing fossil fuels. We need to engage in energy transitions, but they need to be fair globally and nationally. They need to be fair economically and socially, and they need to be sustainable. The next. The situation in the mining sector is different. And, 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 and this for some uh, might sound like good news, uh, but I'm worried. I, I, I want to express a concern. We are talking about the advent of a new mining silk, uh, cycle. Why? Because the energy transition that is going to be accelerated, is being accelerated, demands a lot of minerals. Uh, just one example, one electric vehicle consumes four times more copper than one normal traditional vehicle using fossil fuels, okay? Uh, there will be a huge demand for some traditional minerals, I mean traditional, the ones that we always talk about, no? Copper, silver, gold, uh, ore, no? Iron, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, but and also there will be a huge increase in the demand of, of these rare earths or critical minerals like graphite and indio and, and lithium and, 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 and cobalt and, and others like that. No, So there will be a new cycle of demand and probably a new cycle of high prices for these minerals. No? And you can see how governments and companies are eager to exploit this opportunity because governments are interested in the rents they can obtain from this business through the payment of taxes or royalties. And of course, uh, companies are after the profits uh, that this uh, business might generate for them. No? The problem here that again, as much as you know, government and companies, at least from what we are seeing in Latin America and other places of the world, 
are already competing between each other using race to the bottom policies again. No? So uh, somebody saying, okay, there will be a huge demand of lithium and governments of countries that have resources of lithium are competing with each other, telling investors, no, no, come here, we will be less demanding on environmental standards, or we will ask for less taxes, or we will uh, allow for lesser uh, participation by civil society and citizens at large. And this is already happening. No? And the risk here is that uh, we become what in Latin America we have called zones, uh, sacrifice zones, or zones of sacrifice uh, for the benefit, of, the benefit of humanity. And this is a narrative that I find concerning and worrisome because what we are being told is that the world needs an energy transition. We need to stop global warming. The fate of humanity is at play here. Fantastic, we all agree with that. That energy transition demands a lot of minerals. Okay, that's, that's easy to understand. And you guys have to produce them and you have to do whatever it takes to see that those minerals are produced and therefore we can all engage in the energy transition. So in the end, it's basically like for the sake of humanity, you guys have to sacrifice yourselves. No? Uh, and I, I think uh, this is uh, worrisome because uh, it is unfair. It is, again, the populations of resource-rich territories in lesser developed countries in the Global South, the ones that have to pay the price for something that is presented as convenient for humanity at large, pay the price in terms of health, of human rights, of the health of the ecosystems, of poverty, of exploitation, of lack of dignity, of violation of cultural rights and identities, whatever. No? I think we need to resist that narrative, no? and I think that the, 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 the alternative is to uh, coordinate and put in place high social and environmental standards, procedures, institution, enforcement, to avoid this race to the bottom strategies. Uh, the proposal here, and this is being debated in Latin America, not only by civil society activists and NGOs, but also by the United Nations agencies here in, in, in this part of the world, we need to coordinate a, like a regional platform. We need to get countries together to convene on high standards uh, regarding civil society participation, consultation rights, human rights, environmental, whatever, no? And, 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 and tell the world, you want our minerals, you need our minerals, okay. But it has to be done with these high standards and you are not going to make us compete against each other, lowering our standards to see who attracts this kind of investment. So we are talking about a regional platform to negotiate the conditions in which the Latin America region participates in this new mining cycle. No? And at the same time, because we have learned that depending on mining exports is strategic suicide, we need to see that this new mining cycle is accompanied by strong policies for diversification. So we need to see how uh, economic linkages, what we call backward linkages, horizontal ones, forward linkages, and we need to see that financial linkages, this is the technical concept we use to refer to the use of the extractive rents, no? that all these kinds of linkages, including the use of the mining rent, and of course also the oil rent, uh, has to be applied to sustain diversification strategies. So even if we might participate in a new mining cycle, we do not reinforce our dependency on mining we do not deepen our primary exporting condition. Next, please. Uh, and, and, and this is, these are the components of this post-extractivist strategy. Uh, we need first to stop this race to the bottom policies, which I have already mentioned, no? Uh, we need to end them. That's not the way to go. If our countries compete between each other, lowering all kinds of standards, we are all going to lose in the end, and that's not the way to go, no? 
In all cases, we need to diversify the engines of growth, of employment and incomes. Uh, we also need uh, to push for energy transitions to clean and sustainable sources, but they have to be fair and just. We need to transform the institutions uh, so that decision making is, doesn't respond uh, to rent seeker public officials or to uh, gain seeking uh, companies, but uh, the decision making has the objective or response to the objective of inclusive and sustainable paths to well being. We need to work in transforming the culture, our culture as uh, human beings, no? uh, to build better relations in society and with nature. And we need to reinvent globalization on the basis of stronger national and regional domestic markets and integration. Globalization, as we have known it in the last 20 or 30 years, is losing traction. Uh, the crisis has shown the fragility of the national value chains, and the trend is to rethink globalization from regional perspectives, rebuilding internal national markets and building regional domestic markets, no? uh, and to build value chains at the regional level rather than just pretend to going back to globalization as we saw it before. And I think the next, the next one, please, yes. Now, in order to do so, we need to address the problems of governance. Uh, in, in very general terms, uh, we traditionally have had decision-making systems that are based on, on the sectors that are interested in mining and oil. In the case of Latin America, this is typically the ministries of economy and finance who are rent seekers. They see in oil and mining an easy source of rent. And then you have the ministries of mining, of oil, of mining and energy or whatever, who are the ones that promote these investments. And usually they are captured by uh, people, uh, representatives of the companies that are interested in these businesses. No? And uh, and, and so we need to uh, change that decision-making uh, system. Just a second. We need to change that decision-making system, uh, it, uh, which is, I was saying, sector-based, which is also centralist in terms that it is the central government that makes all the important decisions with no participation of subnational authorities. And we need to change a system that it's excluding uh, which means that people have no say. No, it's only public officials in these two ministries that make all the important decisions. And we need to move to what I have named a polycentric decision-making system. This is not my idea. This is I learned in meetings with the indigenous leadership in my country that they were discussing this proposal. What does it mean? It means that at the central government, you have to strengthen and empower other institutions that are not the investment promoters or the rent seekers. You need to empower, for example, the Ministry of, of the Environment or those entities that are responsible for fighting of poverty or protecting human rights or guaranteeing the rights of indigenous peoples. No? You have to see that these other sectors of central government have the same or even more power than those that are promoting these extractive investments and seeking extractive rents. It also has to be multi-level. No? You have to see that uh, subnational governments uh, that have a mandate over the territories that, are, that contain the resources and where the investments are going to be made and the impacts are going to be felt, you have to see that these subnational governments also have a say. And finally, it has to be multi-actor. Uh, you have to see that the people that live in the territories also have a say in decision making. And they, this means uh, consultation rights for indigenous peoples. This is a, a very important issue here in Latin America. But it means, in general, consultation rights to all, all the people living in those territories, because in the end, it is their lives and their livelihoods that you are talking about. 
So uh, we not only need a post-extractivist uh, transition in terms of the economy, diversification in terms of energy, you no know, energy transitions and whatnot, but we also need a radical change in the way the sector is governed, the way decisions are made regarding natural resources in our countries. Uh, and, and I have, uh, in, in this slide, slide uh, I have uh, focused on the decision-making system, but of course it's not only a matter of uh, changing the institutions, changing the norms, the laws, the, the, the institutions at large, but there, behind that, there's also a question of power, of uh, the asymmetry of power. No? Uh, you want to make it multi-actor. You want to involve in the decision-making system the people of the territories, where we're talking about usually the peoples that have no power, no? Or, or, or that establish a very asymmetric relation of power with the economic elites of the country and with a large foreign corporations that are under, uh, after these resources. No? So to, to make this new polycentric decision-making system work, you need to empower those who are traditionally powerless, meaning the citizens, the poor, women, indigenous groups, no? and, and all those peoples in those uh, territories that are going to be impacted by these decisions and that traditionally have no say in what happens uh, to them. That's my uh, presentation. Uh, I hope uh, you find it of interest. I hope some of these ideas resonate with you, uh, with the problems, the history, the problems and the perspectives of the uh, mining sectors uh, in, in Georgia and, and the region at large. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, I think your keynote was um, extremely thoughtful and uh, deeply illuminating. Um, thank you so, so much for it. Um, uh, I have a couple questions. Um, one of them concerns um, this very central theme that you brought up in the lecture, um, the idea of competition between um, third world countries um, or the, the less developed countries or the developing countries, whatever you might want to call them, um, all competing for this highly mobile, you know, financial capital um, um, by, you know, offering increasingly more lax regulations, um, increasingly more opaque uh, institutional uh, settings uh, for these companies to operate in. Um, and I, and, and I do share, um, uh, this the the centrality and then the importance of that um, uh, of that competition between countries as a, as a real obstacle um, for for all of us who are in it. Um, um, the the question I had is: Do we have any examples um, from the South American context or anywhere else you might be familiar with of a regional or global cooperation? Um, that would make us more hopeful about the possibility of um, turning the tide uh, in, in that sort of race. Uh, the only thing I can think of would be the maybe the OPEC, you know, um, uh, structure, which was not, uh, you know, uh, which was not put in place for any social or environmental reasons. Uh, far from it, uh, it is a pretty cynical sort of partnership of oil producing nations, right? But I was wondering if we have anything that would, you know, that could potentially make us more hopeful uh, that, you know, these um, countries were all trapped in the same vicious sort of race to the bottom could, you know, potentially start collaborating um, and entering in different sort of relationships of solidarity and, and cooperation. Uh, I would say not really, but something is happening. Uh, not really because uh, so far what we have been able to document as civil society activists looking at these issues is that what prevails is race to the bottom, no? So constantly you see uh, the mining companies or the oil companies, for example, in my country, in Peru, constantly saying, we need to lower royalties because look, Colombia has just done that and Chile charges a little bit less and Brazil is more attractive because they defer the payment until the third year while we, I don't know, force it in the second year or whatnot. They're constantly comparing themselves and trying to lower the standards as the way to, to, to become uh, attractive. No, uh, We just had a massive strike of uh, plantation workers. 
agricultural plantation workers in, 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 in we have a, a huge our exporting platform in, in coastal Peru, no? And that has become very, very important globally, no? Uh, but we just had a huge massive strike, no? Uh, uh, demanding better working conditions and demanding a repeal of a law that uh, uh, cut the rights by half. I mean, they were formalized as workers, but with half vacations, half salary, half compensation, half everything, okay? And, and, and these companies were paying half the income tax as the rest of the sector of the economy, no? And the argument of the companies uh, opposing this, of course, massive strike and opposing changes in the law was, but then we will not be competitive. If we pay the same salary as is paid in a car factory or whatever, no? If we pay the same taxes, if, if a guy that owns a restaurant pays, then we will not be competitive in the world. Our success is that we exploit our workers. That, that, that is the, the basis of, and they say it. It's amazing. I mean, I think it's cynical, it's immoral, but it's just the way it is, no? You're going to kill this successful industry if you want me to pay him the same he will make in any other job, no? Uh, so the choices are either you have no income at all you, or you accept a diminished no, uh, the rights uh, cut by half. No? And that's what uh, unfortunately happens. No? Now, uh, at the same time, I, th I, I see two lights at the end of the tunnel. One is that ECLAC, which is the Econ Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, no? there's, there's these regional bodies of, of, of the United Nations everywhere, or ours is called ECLAC, has managed to move ahead a, a regional agreement called the Escazú Agreement. Escazú is a very small town in Costa Rica where the meetings, uh, in, in the country of Costa Rica where the meetings took place, no? And it's a, an agreement to uh, protect uh, human rights, uh, protect environmental defenders, uh, activists on the environment, uh, to make uh, environmental information more accessible, to increase transparency in the sector, and, and to guarantee access to environmental justice, to see that the justice systems in the country are able to respond no? uh, to claims from peoples about environmental damage or, or whatever. No? And this is very important because this is in fact setting up a platform. And so far 11 out of 20 something countries in North America have signed into it. And civil society activists in every country that has not yet signed are putting up a fight to push the Congresses and the governments to actually sign so that we can have some kind of a shared platform, no? Like we already have on human rights. No? I think it's the only region in the world we have a regional inter-American human rights uh, convention and an inter-American human rights court where citizens of our countries can go to court and denounce your government, no? And demand that the court forces the government to protect your rights or or to undo some kind of violation of human rights or something like that, no? So we are going towards an environmental agreement that would set high standards, no? Not specifically for mining and oil, but in general terms would help uh, increase, no? And make tougher standards and procedures. Uh, that's a light that, that I see at the end of, of the darkness in which we live, no? The other one is that ECLAC itself, uh, uh, in discussion with civil society, I think this is a success of civil society advocacy you know, and, and activism, uh, is discussing this idea of a platform. No? ECLAC is coming forward uh, with a formal proposal, a suggestion to governments. I mean, ECLAC has no power to force any government to do anything, but it is an important body, no? and they're coming forward with the idea of shared standards. No? Uh, to see that we do better in this new mining cycle, no? learning from the mistakes of race to the bottom policies in the past. Uh, but no, there's no concrete experience. It's not that Latin America is great because governments understand and cooperate and whatnot. Our governments as, as are corrupt, as rent seekers, no? as pro-extractives as any other government, 
but uh, I think that we are managing at least to place this topic in the agenda and to see that some influential regional bodies are uh, looking to it no? and, and start promoting it and, and hopefully uh, something uh, may happen. No? I'm always optimistic that if we put up a fight, uh, we can make some things happen. By the way, these workers have won the fight. Uh, the law, the special law that the agribusinesses had in Peru has been repealed uh, by the Congress yesterday, no? And now they will enjoy the full rights, no? That every other worker uh, enjoys. So sometimes when you put up a fight, <laughs> things uh, happen and we trust that uh, this fight for a regional coming together of governments to define high standards, no? and to avoid competing with each other on that basis uh, will happen eventually. But so along, the, to... along the same lines of sort of um, looking for alternatives and for um, exerting uh, pressure on, 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 on governments uh, to cooperate. And, uh, so in that process, and we have you know, multiple you know, theories of change and conceptualizations of transitions that, that you've mentioned as well, uh, whether they be, you know, transition like just transitions or energy transitions um or you know just broader conceptualizations of sustainable development and so on and so forth um what i was wondering is you know what do you see uh, or who do you see as the main sort of agent of change in these processes um who is in a position um to exert you know pressure you know most successfully most effectively do we have to look back to you know traditional notions of class or should we be looking towards transnational social movements that might be on the horizon or should we look up to nation states or international organizations in other words who might be the the sort of or, or what conceptualizations of agency do we have um who would be able to voice um and um be to be to voice these concerns and to be vocal about change when it comes to extraction um and dependencies and, and unsustainable dependencies on, on on mining well i would say that the lesson learned again and again and again is that you need an informed organized and mobilized society to achieve change. Everything else has to do with alliances that you need to build in order to strengthen your position, right? So sure, uh, you need international alliances. Uh, indigenous peoples, for example, in Latin America, they very early understood that they were weak vis-a-vis -vis their national states, no? But when then, then they developed uh, sub-regional organizations in the Amazon basins, in the Andes, in Central America, and then they built regional Latin American indigenous coalitions, and then they reached out to international human rights organizations, they reached out to the United Nations. No, they, they established international working alliances, and they managed to get ILO 169 consultation rights, no? they have gained a lot of traction, the, the United Nations uh, statement on indigenous and Aboriginal peoples and the rights and whatnot, no? But in the end, if they are not strong locally, if they don't mobilize and put up a fight, everything else is not going to make it. So I would say that that's the main lesson learned always. You need a mobilized, organized, informed, social movement organization, no? Yeah, class, why not? I mean, let's not be afraid of speaking in those terms, no? So the, my feeling is that we try to rebrand things and rename things because some words become like, I don't want to mention the word class because then I may sound like a 19th century Marxist and that's so far away. Uh, well, I don't care, I mean, let's say class, let's say social sector, let's say social interest, let's say the exploited, whatever, no? In the end, we're talking about the same people that we have been talking about since the 1860s, no? Those who, who do the work, no? that gain the less, that are exploited, that have no rights, that have no power, okay? They need to organize, they need to be informed, they need to mobilize, they need to put up a fight, no? 
so for me, that's, that's the lesson learned. Of course, you need allies. And for example, uh, energy transition. No? Uh, we need an energy transition. Uh, but uh, uh, let me give you a concrete example we're talking about now in, 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 in Latin America about Colombia. Colombia has a very important coal sector, no? and they have entire regions of Colombia that depend on coal production. No? The, I mean, it pollutes everything, it destroys the ecosystem, it has a gross impact on the health of, of, the, of the people, but at the same time, it's very labor demanding, it generates a lot of jobs. So the economy of those territories is dependent on that. And, and people want out of coal, no? Uh, but at the same, but and, and, and they want to engage in an energy transition in, in those territories to stop depending on coal, and they want to engage in economic diversification in those territories. No, but the thing is that so if the people in, in those territories do not organize and move, nothing is going to change. The companies, of course, want to continue producing coal because that's their game, that's their business. No, uh, and the government wants coal to continue because it provides a lot of rent, no? And they are willing to go until the last day in which there is some kind of demand of coal in the world to carry on producing coal, no? no. So what people in those territories need are allies, no? So for example, you need to establish an alliance with business sectors that are interested in cleaner energy. You need to establish an alliance, for example, with a tourist sector. No, I mean they want to have a, a clean ecosystem. That's part of their business. That the water is clean. That the river is clean. No, uh, so people need to establish those kinds of alliances, even with other business sectors. No, that could be more interested in working through a, a transition. No, because that's good for their other businesses which are not the coal business no they even need to establish alliances with sector of the government there are some sectors of the government that see that if something is not done about coal the end will be a disaster because one of these days a carbon tax is going to be imposed and that business that sector is going to collapse and what are they going to do with 100,000 people that are employed in the coal sector? So some sectors of government are looking into this, no? But again, if the people in those territories do not organize themselves, nothing will replace that. Now, once you have organization, mobilization, information, then of course you need to establish all kinds of broad alliances to gain people to your side and to alter the, the power correlation no? and, and, and win the upper hand in the kind of fight and the kind of proposal that you need to put forward. And yes, international alliances are basic there. No? Mm -hmm. and and maybe finally, I wanted to ask about the, uh, the COVID, a COVID-related question, which I feel like is a must, uh, as, as we are, after all, uh, no recording you know, this um, keynote in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, you know, do you see uh, this pandemic as perhaps a, a window for change, or is it the closing of the window for, for change? Um, it is, um, the pandemic has um, uh, pushed us to change certain things about our you know, way of life, right? Um, this forum itself was to be, uh, was meant to be a physical forum, uh, a three-day get-together of lots of people from different parts of the world and now, and now here we are in a zoom conference and we probably saved you know a lot of you know greenhouse gases in the, in the process of you know moving this whole thing online um, and um, in other ways as well in, in terms of the way we do business the way we do culture and then social life it, it is changing a, a lot in, in our daily lives um, and uh, is pushing us to rethink some of our traditional ways in, in, in multiple ways so both personally and collectively but then on the other hand it is generating sort of new economic pressure and um, um, and an economic crisis, which doesn't leave too much space for um, ecological considerations. On the other hand, you know, you know, on the, uh, we actually see a an intensification of of resource exploitation as part of the whole shock doctrine, post crisis sort of shock doctrine. Um, 
uh, programs. Um, so I was just wondering what you think about it. You know, is this a good time to think of alternatives or is it the worst possible time for, to think of alternatives and of changes and transitions? Well, I think it's an opportunity. There's no certainty, but I think it's an opportunity to put up a fight for different things to happen. What I see is that the impact on the mining sector has been smaller and shorter in times. Well, when you look at the, at the evolution of prices for 2020, most of the, the prices of minerals are back to where they were in January or even higher, no? in the case of copper and gold and whatnot. No? So there has not been that much of, of an impact. Uh, in the case of oil, the, the impact has been dramatic. No? I mean, the, the fall in prices was brutal and the recovery is to be slow. It is estimated that by, that by 2025, the Brent uh, barrel price will be around $50, the barrel, no? which is still less than what it was in January and, and 2019 and, 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 and those years. No? Uh, and the, what I see that is happening is that uh, there is actually a, a very risky situation because there has been this strong recession, no? an economic slowdown. Uh, generally speaking. In Latin America has been very strong. In, in my country, in Peru, there has been a, a, a 12 or 14 points fall in, in GDP from last year, which is it's rather dramatic. No, It's a massive recession. And so, and, and this means for governments that next year they will see less rents because there, there is a fiscal impact of, of, of an economic slowdown. Of course, there's less public, uh, people pay less taxes and less royalties and, and the incomes uh, come down. And also because of the price of minerals came down and the price of oil has come down, when you sell those, you get less, no? less, less monies. No? And, and, and so the risk is that uh, governments see in mining and oil investments the easier and faster way to recuperate. And this is what's happening in Latin America. You see a super strong campaign by the mining companies and by the oil companies saying, listen, give us a handout, make it easy for us, and we guarantee you that with three or four large-scale projects that you help us put forward and defeat the resistance of the local people and de defeat the bu bureaucracy of uh, environmental paperwork and environmental impact assessments and this and that that take too long, if you make it easy for us, three or four large-scale projects, three more points of uh, growth in the GDP, and you're out of this mess, no? We are the ones. Because if you're going to wait for the small businesses to recuperate and they pay very little taxes and this and that, that's going to take forever. So you want a quick fix? We are the ones, no? And, 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 and they're working very hard on that and building a narrative about how strategic we are, how important we are, and we are the ones to lead the reactivation package. No? But we need to low down, lower down these standards, these things that are hurt us and delay our investment projects. And so here we have an open debate about, for example, virtual consultations. No? Because now of the argument is health. They never cared about the health of the local people and now they are super concerned. No, 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 no. We cannot convey the local people for consultations. It's very risky. No, let's do it by fax. Let's do it by internet. No, how can you have a meaningful intercultural <laughs> free prior informed consultation and consent by two virtual Zoom meetings? No, um, between local indigenous peoples and elites in here and there. No. So uh, it's a problem. It is a problem. Of course, it is also an opportunity. No, if we managed <coughs> to work around the concept of a green recovery, no, if we managed to work around the concept of an inclusive recovery, in which the bailouts are not to the big corporations but but to the little ones, no, small businesses and whatnot. No, if we managed uh, to see that in order to sustain the recovery and to bail out and help and subsidize if needed, no? small businesses and whatnot, we will need tax reforms. 
to get the richer sectors of society to pay their fair share, but we will need green tax reforms to punish those that pollute the most, no? and create incentives for companies and businesses of all kinds to move into the cleaner energy sector. No? The problem is that it takes time to come up with those alternatives. No? While the mining companies and the oil companies, they don't need to come up with anything. They just need to say, if you help me out, I will guarantee you reactivation in two years. No? Uh, so while we as civil society activists get together, come up with a proposal, ECLAC is sort of thinking about the same things. By the way, if you read IMF, if you read World Bank, if you read <coughs> United Nations, if you read um, regional banks, everybody is talking about inclusive and green recovery. It has become like a standard catchword, uh, like a concept that everybody shares. And uh, supposedly we are all in agreement. But when you look at exactly what governments are doing, no, the rest is like a lot of blah, 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 blah. But in fact, what is happening is, I think, is that they are strengthening this narrative about mining is everything, oil is everything, and the rest is blah, 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 because you need growth and you need fiscal incomes now and you look at the biden plan yeah sure 20 years from now maybe green investments will not make a difference but if you're coming out of a recession let's not waste time discussing these intellectual things and blah blah let's just allow these mining projects and these oil projects to go ahead that's a prevailing mood i would say between governments and and, and companies and and, and and again we are putting up a fight no, uh, but, but it's, a, it's a fight that has no certain results. We, we may not win, and unfortunately, no, the crisis will deepen our primary exporting um, condition. Now, but there, there's another angle that you were posing here, no? Changes in the life of people. And I would say, yes, especially regarding the oil sector, the energy sector, no? I, I have the feeling that uh, the crisis has accelerated the trend that global warming concerns were already pushing for, no? Pushing towards, no? Uh, so, for example, when you see this, this uh, British Petroleum Energy Outlook, the 2020 British Petroleum Energy Outlook that I have quoted in the presentation, no? What they're saying is, this was already happening, because if you see the British Petroleum Energy Outlook of 2019, they were saying, look, it's the end of oil. Let's face it. Let's start thinking about something else, no? And now what they're saying is, this has accelerated. We thought that oil would peak in 2030. Well, maybe it peaked now, no? Uh, and, 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 and the collapse in the prices, no, has, in the fact that we are all forced to to proceed and to work virtually like we are doing now, no, I think has shown the world that we can exist and we can still perform and we can still have this dialogue without using that much oil, no, which are, without generating that much greenhouse effect gases, no. In the cities, uh, the use of bicycles, no, of other kinds of mobility, no, uh, people being more aware, no, of the importance of these matters. I think that has been a good impact, no. Uh, but the thing is that these cultural changes take time, no, and they ha they have concrete results in time. But in the short time. Uh, companies and governments, I think, are negotiating the wrong deals. Uh, you can see that just came out from UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program, along with the Stockholm Environmental Institute and others. They just came out with a second, what they call the production gap. You know, uh, UNEP always has produced the mitigation gap, no? Uh, saying how we are falling short of mitigation targets. Now, this is the second year they have come out with a production gap saying how actual investment plans 
negotiated between companies and governments have nothing to do with the Paris agreements. There's a huge gap between what, what we should be thinking about producing and what we are really thinking about producing. No? So a lot of meetings, agreements, but in the end, no, in real life, companies convince governments that this is the way to go, this will generate growth, rent, and global warming, I don't know who cares, let's see about it maybe later. No? In Latin America, Guyana is a small country that never produced any oil. They found oil two or three years ago, and they are delighted in embarking in massive oil production. And you tell them, hello, Paris, <laughs> no? United Nations, climate agreements, and it's like, listen, I don't know. This is going to produce a lot of rain for the next 15 years, and maybe after that we will all go to hell. But in the meantime, a lot of money, no? And, 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 and that's it, no? And that's happening. And this report, the production gap, looks into that problem, no? So, yes, some positive impacts in terms of awareness, of conscience, of changes in the market. It has probably accelerated the twilight no? of, of, of the sunset of, of, of the oil industry, and that's good news. But in the short term, still, companies and governments are trying to make the most out of oil, get them the, the higher amount of money of returns and investments no? when they should be actually doing completely the opposite. They should be starting discussing how do we leave these resources under the ground and how do we migrate to something else, as British Petroleum is doing. I mean, they, as a company, are thinking of becoming uh, an international capitalist, uh, traditional, no, uh, imperialist company, but based on cleaner energy. <laughs> it's like they are, it's not that they are against capitalism or something like that, no, they are still thinking about themselves as a huge energy company, no, and they will behave as such, but they are looking at the ways of the market in, in, in the future. But in most cases, that is not happening. That's very worrisome. Yeah, it looks like we're all going to hell, but uh, some of us are going to enjoy the ride. They're going to enjoy the, the, the road there. Um, I'm going like, to make a hell of a lot of money <laughs> on the way. Um, yeah, we have, I just wanted to let you know we had the same exact dynamic here in Georgia, where one of the first things to get suspended during the pandemic were the regulations requiring public participation, public physical participation in the environmental impact assessment processes. One of the very first things that got suspended in, the, in this whole country. And then uh, in the early days of the pandemic, our prime minister literally named a couple of big infrastructural and hydropower pro projects um, by name and, and said they have to do all they can um, to make sure that these projects you know, go ahead and that these projects uh, develop uh, uh, as fast as possible, and he cited that as a potential, you know, way out of this whole economic crisis. So it's striking and concerning um, how much of what you said during your keynote and in the Q and A, how much of it resonates with us here as well in Georgia, and it does underline the fact that these struggles, these problems, are are global as well. And it's so important to have these conversations cross borders so that we could share. Um, experiences um, and not just you know denounce as you said in the opening to not just you know denounce these uh, structures as um, oppressive and ecologically unsustainable but also think of alternatives together and collectively and, and to share experiences in that uh, direction as well um, I'm gonna hand it back to Tamar now thank you so so much and I think we're gonna wrap it up there Yes, um, thank you a lot. Uh, it was like really, we, we have a lot of t to take out from this lecture and I'm pretty sure Georgian um, activists and the people who are struggling on the frontiers of the extractivist uh, places, um, uh, they're going to have a lot of to think about and somehow like, to articulate maybe in a more deep, deep ways. Uh, I'm going to sp switch into the Georgian right now and like do this kind of small conclusion. Didi Madloba, well, as with Mogwisimina, Didi Madloba, trust me, it's all keynote speakers, lectors, Carlos Monges, trying out to look at our Bundabis. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. And we're going to keep, keep in touch, I'm pretty sure.
Patlova Georgi, Nahontis. Thank you very much. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thanks. Yep, thank you and have a great rest of the weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.